All right, we are now beginning with our last tape in this series. This is the parable of the fig tree. And it's basically found in Matthew chapter 24, verse 32 and 33. I'm going to read that for you. Now learn a parable of the fig tree when his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves. You know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Now, Israel is symbolized as the fig tree, and we're going to see how that fits into prophecy. So it's important to note first that when the fig tree was cut down, symbolizing Israel being scattered throughout the world in A.D. 70, the stump of the fig tree did not die. Israel was not destroyed. Only their national structure was destroyed. In the verse that I just read, we find our Lord prophesying to the church that when they see the fig stump beginning to grow branches and leaves again, they will know that his second coming is near. History tells us that for almost 2,000 years, the fig stump remained a stump. On May 14, 1948, Israel again became a nation. She was accepted as the 59th member of the United Nations and was recognized by over 68 nations. The stump has produced branches and leaves, and the stage is set for the return of the Lord. Keep in mind that the branches and the leaves stands for its national makeup, stands for the people. Now Luke reveals a secondary prophecy given with this parable that teaches of a great number of nations being established for the first time just before the coming of the Lord. These nations are identified as all the trees. This is found in Luke 21, 29 through 31. I'll read that for you. And he spake to them a parable, Behold the fig tree and all the trees. When they now shoot forth, ye see and know of your own selves that, number, that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, from the time that the fig tree stump put forth its tender branches and Israel became a nation in 1948, dozens of new nations have come into being. In 1962 itself, over 20 Four black nations alone came into being, not counting those new ones of Asia and Europe. Still other nations had declared their independence from the Union of uh, States such as the Soviet Union. So we look at the fig tree stump in history. <clears throat> Jesus, in Matthew 24, 4 through 31, prophesied what would happen to scattered and rejected people of Israel during the church age. And of course, this passage, plus that of Luke 21, verse 20 through 24, answers the three questions asked of him by the apostles in Matthew 24, uh, the second part of verse 3. When Jesus prophesied the destruction of the temple, now, you ought to go back and read this. This is prophecy of the Lord prophesying when this temple would be destroyed. Matthew 24, uh, 3b, the last part of the third verse. Now, I'm going to read uh, this verse. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, <clears throat> Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? Uh, if you look at this closely, the occasion for this first question is found in Matthew 23 and 38. 
when Jesus said to the Jews, your house is left unto you desolate. And in Matthew 24, 2, when he said, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. The apostles, of course, knowing that Jesus was speaking of the destruction of the temple, asked him, well, when shall these things be? And Jesus answered, and when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. That's found in, of course, Luke 21 and 20. Now, I guess you wonder why we skip to, to Luke 21 and 20. Well, notice that this answer about the temple being destroyed is not recorded in Matthew, but in Luke. It speaks of the coming destruction of their temple as well as the national uh, structure. Their national structure speaking of their nation. And uh, we know that that's going to be scattered throughout the world here in this prophecy. Now, a rule of prophecy says that when a prophesied, when, when a uh, prophesied event first occurs, now, that first occurrence is the fulfillment of that prophecy. It necessitates then that uh, Luke 21, 20 was fulfilled in October A.D. 66 when Cestius Gallus and his Roman legions moved against the city of Jerusalem for the first time, completely surrounding it. This was the sign of its approaching desolation. And the Christians living there knew it. Thus, by giving this sign, God was telling the Christians there to get out of Jerusalem. And this is recorded, of course, in Luke 21, 21. Uh, when, when we read that, it says, Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let them that are in the countries enter there into. But how, you might ask, was this to be since they were surrounded by an army? You visualize this, they're surrounded by an army and this prophecy comes true and our Lord tells them to get out. So it presented a dilemma. Uh, Jesus commanded to flee and, fly, and flight is impossible. However, Jesus being God prophesied right. About a month later in November A.D. 66, after the city's food and water supply was exhausted and they were on the very verge of defeat, Cestius Gallus and his Roman legions withdrew completely and left the territory. Down through history, military technicians have been literally baffled trying to explain why Cestus Galeus did this, why he withdrew from Israel. However, by reading and believing the Bible, we can understand it. The encompassing of the city with armies was the sign of imminent desolation of Jerusalem, a sign for the Christians to leave the city because they could not leave while the armies were there. Our Lord removed the armies so the Christians could flee to uh, flee the city, and uh, not be a part of the desolation. In A.D. 70, Titus returned with the army, uh, armies of Rome and uh, threw up a siege that resulted in a sacking and desolation of the city. More than one million people perished in the fall of Jerusalem. Josephus a first century historian in his Antiquity of the Jews tells us that the wave of human blood flowing down through the gutters of the city reached such proportion that whole houses on fire in the southern part were extinguished by this wave of human blood so far as could be ascertained not a Christian perished in the fall of Jerusalem because they believed the sign our Lord gave them and fled at the opportunity provided. How did the temple fare? History records 
that when the siege was over, there was not one stone of the temple left on top of another. Tradition has it that gold leaf was between the stones to enhance the beauty of the temple. The need of the Roman Empire for gold was such that each stone was removed, taken off by itself, and the gold scraped from the stone and added to the coffers of the Roman Empire. Another tradition is that the dome of the temple was made of solid gold. The Holocaust melted the gold, causing it to run down between the stones. The stones had to be separated and the gold scraped off to rescue it from, uh, for the Roman Empire. Now, I don't believe this second one, the dome, because there was no dome on the temple. There might have been gold uh, in the building, but not on a dome, because it had no dome. It was uh, flat roofed. Okay, this was the prophecy of our Lord concerning the desolation of Jerusalem and the temple, and we see this prophecy fulfilled. Now we come to the second question uh, that was asked of Jesus. What shall be the sign of thy coming? The second quest, uh, question asked of Jesus by the apostles was, you see, what shall be the sign of thy coming? Contrary to the teachings of some fundamental scholars who say there are no signs given in the Bible concerning the second coming of Christ, Jesus himself took great pains in Matthew 24 to show that there are. As we look closely at the following scriptures, keep in mind that Matthew 24, 1 through 31, was written to the Jews and not to the church. It is prophecy that tells the Jews what will happen to them from the time of the rejection of Jesus Christ as their Messiah to his second coming. And this is an example of Scripture being addressed. And it is being actually addressed to Israel, while at the same time it is being written for the church. Again, keep in mind that not all Scripture is written to the church, but it's written either to the church or to Israel or to the lost world. But all Scripture is written for the church, so we can learn a lot in this Scripture. The sign of Christ's coming... That is, his second coming comprises several events. The first will be a false Christ, actually many false Christs. This sign will continue across 2,000 years span of time and, and uh, culminate uh, in the coming Antichrist in the latter days. That's called the tribulation period. The second event constitutes wars and rumors of wars throughout the world uh, until he co uh, actually comes. And uh, this will begin with nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. This, actually, this scripture, nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, was literally fulfilled in the First World War, when for the first time nations and kingdoms were part of a worldwide conflict. The third event following the Great War consists of continuous famines, pestilence, including diseases never heard of before, and earthquakes in different places of the world. Note there have been more devastating earthquakes during the 20th century than any other century. In verse 8, Jesus says, these are the beginning of sorrows, or literally in the Greek, the beginning of birth pangs. So, these are sorrows that began with the First World War and, like birth pangs, get closer together until the full birth pangs come. This full sorrow will culminate in the middle of the tribulation period for all Jews, a time known in the Old Testament as the time of Jacob's trouble and revealed by the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5, 3. I'll read that. For when they shall say peace and safety, a false peace, that is, from Antichrist, then a sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child. That's the great tribulation period, and they shall not escape. The fourth event of this sign is given in 
Verse 9, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Notice the first word of this verse, then, which relates this experience to the sign. Thus, sometime after the First World War, there is going to be a worldwide persecution of the Jews resulting from all the nations hating them. This event is most notable in studying world history. During the time between the First and the Second World Wars and uh, before Pearl Harbor tragedy, even at that time, our own country would not allow two shiploads of Jewish refugees from Germany to dock at any of its ports. Unable to find a place to dock, they were turned back to Nazi Germany. Eventually, many of these, along uh, with an estimated one-third of the Jewish population in the world, were destroyed by Nazi Germany, Adolf Hitler, in the de death camps of Germany. But despite, th th despite this, the hatred and persecution of the Jew is still among all nations of the world today. One by one, governments of the world are dropping assistance to the nation of Israel, the budding of the fig tree. Keep in mind that Israel has budded now as a fig tree in 1948 and join those who are against her. So the nations of the world are beginning to drop this assistance. This will continue until the close of the Great Tribulation when all nations under Antichrist will come against her in attempt to utterly destroy her. Only then will the Lord appear and become the destroyer of Israel's enemies. All of this hatred was and is for my name's sake. Look in verse 9b. Now, how can these unsaved Jews be persecuted for Christ's sake? Well, the Jews are hated for three particular reasons. For giving us the Bible, that is the human means of writing it. For giving us Jesus the Christ after the flesh. And for being chosen by God to be his witnesses throughout the world. For these three reasons, Satan hates the Jew, and that is why the world hates the Jew. Now I want to get back to the budding of the fig tree. In the same passage of Matthew, we have these verses. Now learn a parable of the fig tree when his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves. Ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. From this point in our text to Matthew 25, 31, our Lord leaves off speaking to uh, Israel and speaks to the church. Remember that parables themselves were never spoken to, to Israel. So here we come into a parable. So therefore he's not speaking with Israel. He's leaving off speaking to Israel. Now he's talking to the church. All that is written here is written to the church and for the church. Thus in this beginning section, Jesus is telling us, that when we see the fig tree stump once again grow into a fig tree with branches and leaves, a Jewish nation with people, then we will know that Christ is about to return, that is, the rapture of the church. So following the appearance of the fig tree, there will be times on earth likened unto the days of Noah. You find that in Matthew 24, 37 through 39, and of Locke. That is Luke 17, verse 28 through verse 29. Society themselves will forget God and turn all their interest to sinful pleasure. That is eating and drinking, which stands for 
sinful pleasure, and gross immorality, marrying and giving in marriage, which really means wife swapping, including uh, all the other things of, of immorality, homosexuality, which is the chief sin of Sodom, and uh, they'll begin to worship money through commercial enterprise. It says here, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. They didn't know anything else but these things. The days in which we presently live have a carbon copy of the days of Noah and Lot. As we look, we see we are the same people in our society. The people of this world are flourishing in these sins and in their hatred of God and will continue to do so until the great tribulation period. At the close of the great tribulation, our Lord will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. He will come in flaming fire to take vengeance on them that know not God and who obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will punish them with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Now you'll find that in 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 through 10. This final consummation of the age will occur seven years after the rapture of the church and no more than a generation beyond the budding of the fig tree. To summarize the answers to this second question, Jesus said that the generation that sees a worldwide war followed by famines, pestilence, and earthquakes, worldwide persecution of the Jews in which untold numbers would be killed and followed soon after by Israel becoming a nation, that generation would see his return. Now I want to come to the last question. This is the third question asked of Jesus by his apostles. And you can go back to the beginning of Matthew and read it here. And here's the third question. When shall these things be? That is the destruction of Israel. The second question was, what shall be the sign of thy coming? The third and last they asked is, what shall be the sign of the end of the world? The correct translation is not the end of the world, but the end of the age. The end of the world will not take, pl take place until 1,000 years after the end of the age, and the end of the age will not take place until Jesus comes to establish his kingdom for 1,000 years. In Matthew 24... 15 through 21, we see the first sign of this present age drawing to a swift close. Let me read this for you. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken, by, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso letteth, let him understand, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. The abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, then, refers to the placing of the image of Antichrist in the holy of holies of the temple. This will be in the midst of the week, that is, the beginning of the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. Life will be given to this image by Satan and worship of the image exacted from the people under the penalty of death if they refuse to worship him. You find that in Revelation 13 and 15. The, the great tribulation, or the last three and a half years, will be consummated by the darkening of the sun, the failure of the moon to give light, the falling of stars from heavens, and the appearance of the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Verses 29 through verse 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That's Matthew 24, 30. 
Now, I went back from the parable to Matthew 20, to show you where he's going to leave off talking to Israel. He leaves off at the coming of the Lord. Then he begins talking to the church with the parable of the fig tree. But this is all part of the answer of the last question. Now, there are also a lot of, of, of events that will constitute signs at the end of this age. First, the rapture of the saints, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 17. The sudden, that is, the sudden catching away of the church, resulting in a vast number of individuals whose bodies will not be found on the earth. This should be a sign to those remaining that the end of the age is fast approaching, but only those who will be saved during the tribulation will be able to discern this. Second, the appearance all over the world of 144,000 Jewish evangelists simultaneously beginning to preach the gospel of the kingdom. This will be a sign that the age is fast drawing to a close. Third, the rise of Antichrist as seen in 2 Thessalonians 2 will be a sign to the earth dwellers that the end of the age is near. Fourth, the rebuilding and the destruction of the city of Babylon Described in Revelation 18 will be another sign of the imminent end of the age. Fifth, the institution of a worldwide system of idol worship headed by the worship of Antichrist and his image described in Revelation 13 and 15 will be evidence that the age is about to end. Now for some closing thoughts. At the close of the seven-year tribulation period, Christ will appear the second time with power and great glory, Matthew 24 and 30. In his wrath, he will invade human history and destroy the kingdoms of this world, Revelation 19, 11 through 16, Daniel 2, 44. At his coming, there will be such a great earthquake that every city of the world will fall. Revelation 6, 12, Revelation 16, 18 through 19. The earth dwellers, of course, will be in total terror and will frantically call for the mountains and the rocks to fall upon them to hide them from his wrath. That's Revelation 6, verse 15 through 16. Isaiah 2, verse 19 through 21. Isaiah 34, verse 4 through 6. And there will be untold millions that will perish. Many will literally be frightened to death. Luke 21, verse 26 through 27. Others will perish by great hailstone weighing more than 100 pounds falling on them from heaven. Revelation 16, verse 21. Still others will have the flesh of their bodies instantly consumed away by the glory of his presence, Zechariah 14, verse 12. At his arrival, he will touch down on Mount Olive and cause an earthquake of such proportions that it will make a valley in the mountains of approximately 200 miles, Zechariah 14, verse 4 through 5. Those of the elect of Israel who are gathered from the four corners of the earth, and you'll find that, by the way, in Matthew 24, 31, how they will escape down this valley of the mountain as Israel escaped from Pharaoh through the valley of the sea, Zechariah 14, 5. Yet this number will constitute only one-third of all the Jews. Two-thirds of them will have perished by the hands of the armies of the world sent against them. Only one-third will survive after being tried and refined in this fire, or in this, I should say, this furnace of affliction. you find that in Zechariah 13, verse 8 through 9, Isaiah 48, verse 10. In their escape through this valley, called Jehoshaphat, you'll find that in Joel 3, 2, and 12 through 14, 
the armies of the world will attempt to follow, as Pharaoh and his armies did, and will be utterly trampled to death by Christ like grapes in a wine press. Blood will flow up to the horses' bridles for almost the entire length of the valley. Revelation 14, 20. Revelation 19, 15. Isaiah 63, 3 through 4. Antichrist and a false prophet will be cast alive into the lake of fire. Revelation 19, 20. Satan will be locked up in the bottomless pit for 1,000 years. Revelation 20, 1 through 3. And the rest of the lost world will be condemned by Christ from his earthly uh, throne of glory and slain. Matthew 25, verse 41 through 46. Not one lost person will be alive to enter into the kingdom of heaven. The third tree of scripture then, that is the fig tree, is one of the signs that tells us we are near to the close of this age. In 1948, Israel again became a nation. At that time, the fig tree stump put out branches and leaves and became a tree. Jesus, in Matthew 24, 34, tells us that the generation of people who were alive in 1948, when Jesus became a nation, will not all pass away until all these things be fulfilled. He also tells us that when the church sees the fig tree, they can know that the rapture is near, that he is at the doors, ready to secretly catch out his church. Will you be ready? That ends our study of the book uh, that I wrote, The Matthew Mysteries. It could be for you that, it might, uh, that uh, you might get more out of this, not only to have the tapes, but also the book. And uh, if you want an address to write for that book, uh, send uh, 1095 plus $2 for shipping to Gary T. Whipple Ministries. That's, uh, I'm going to spell my last name for you, W-H-I-P-P-L-E. And uh, I want you to send it to 68 Mallorca. That's M-A-J-O-R-C-A -A, Drive Winter Springs that's two words Florida 32708 If you'll send that we'll try to get it back to you just as fast as possible. Been a pleasure for this study. May God bless.